Hello and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. This week, why is it so difficult to prosecute militaries for alleged war crimes? We speak to experts about the problems with international law. There is no judge. There is no jury for sure. They are judge, jury and executioner. And a look at why sarcasm is so difficult for children to understand. They might get that the speaker doesn't mean what they say, but they really aren't enjoying the joke. I'm Dan Reno in San Francisco. And I'm Gemma Ware in London. You're listening to The Conversation Weekly, the world explained by experts. has launched airstrikes at Islamic State or ISIL targets in Iraq. In, an in the early hours of September the 20th, 2015, Basim Razo's life changed forever. Basim lived with his family in a house in the Iraqi city of Mosul, next door to his brother. That night, US military intelligence mistakenly identified the location as an Islamic State compound. The US passed the information to the Dutch, their coalition partners in the fight against ISIS. The Dutch Air Force bombed the two houses in an airstrike. Basim's wife, daughter, brother and nephew were all killed. Basim was severely injured but survived. He still suffers chronic pain today. According to an account of his case by the New York Times, after a series of investigations, the US military offered Basim 15,000 US dollars as a condolence payment. He refused, saying the amount was an insult. Then, last year, the Dutch government made Bossum its own voluntary offer of compensation, reportedly just over 1.1 million US dollars, and he accepted. Bossum's case is both tragically familiar and unusual. Familiar in that civilian deaths have become a common part of modern warfare. UK-based watchdog claimed that more than 4,500 civilians have been killed in coalition airstrikes in Iraq and Syria since Operation... And unusual because compensation for survivors of military strikes and their families is incredibly rare. This is a story about the problems with international laws around war, about a disconnect between what the law actually says and who gets to use it. The result is that hundreds, sometimes thousands of people like Basim are killed and injured and their families have no real way to seek justice. We heard about Basim's story from Craig Jones. I'm Craig Jones. I'm a lecturer in political geography at Newcastle University and I'm based in the north of England in Newcastle. Craig spoke to Basim for his research into the consequences of aerial targeting and the legal advice behind it. For this research, Craig has also been meeting a very secretive group of people, military lawyers. What these people do is give legal advice to commanders in situations of targeted killing. They give legal advice and render opinions on when a military is able to strike and when it might be prudent not to strike. Craig has recently written a book about his research, which shows how militaries are increasingly employing lawyers to help make decisions. By hanging around military bases in the US and Israel, he's managed to talk to some of those lawyers involved in targeted killing operations in Afghanistan, Iraq and Gaza. The lawyers are literally both soldiers and lawyers. They have professional legal degrees in their respective countries and they will also pass the bar in those countries. When they enlist in the military, they have that legal background or they're given that legal background as part of their training. And then they do basic training to fire assault weapons. They do the assault courses and all the other stuff that soldiers have to do. They know how to fight. They know how to apply the law. Negotiated in the aftermath of the Second World War, the treaties of the Geneva Convention set out, among other things, the so-called laws of armed conflict, what can and cannot be done in war under international humanitarian law. Since 1949, all of the world states have signed these treaties. The main purpose of this body of international law is to maintain a level of humanity in armed conflict, to prevent the deaths of civilians and reduce suffering where possible. A military lawyer's job is to interpret these rules of war and weigh the legal risk of targeting a particular person or building before a commander gives the green light. To understand exactly where military lawyers fit into the decision-making process, Craig described to me what a typical scenario might be inside what's called an operation room or war room. Intelligence image analysis, drones, all of those things feed into that room where those decisions are made. What happens is in a sort of war room scenario, so for example, a wanted quote unquote terrorist is on the run, or there is some military equipment in the bottom uh, of a building. And the question is, 
militarily, is it a good idea to target that? Do we need to target? And so you need to establish what's called military necessity for that. But there's also all kinds of questions. Is it legal? Is it smart to do so? And so increasingly over the last 20 years, lawyers have been invited into the room. For example, a terrorist, quote unquote, was being interrogated in Gaza and the Israeli military wanted to kill the terrorist and those around him in case he relinquished security information. They couldn't make a decision. They didn't know whether it was legal. They thought they might get in trouble. And so they call into the room a very senior military commander and ask him to make a decision. This commander comes in, gets upset. He is actually being asked to make a decision, reaffirms this idea that he is the legal advisor. I give advice. I don't make a decision. Uh, and then basically goes on to give permission for the strike. And ultimately, that's what happens. There is a whole debate about whose responsibility ultimately is in the war room. My argument is that that responsibility is sort of diffuse uh, and it's made among several and many people simultaneously rather than one. Craig says he first heard about the use of military lawyers during Israel's 2009 war with Gaza. Israel's air force unleashes devastation on the Gaza Strip. On the ground in one of the world's most densely populated areas, it's a gruesome scene. But their history is much longer. Israel has been using military lawyers since the uh, early 2000s for targeting situations. But the history of legal advice in Israel actually goes back to the foundation of the Israeli state in 1948. And those lawyers have created the laws of occupation to govern the Palestinian territories. But it wasn't until the post 9-11 era that they began being involved in targeting operations. Israel's use of military lawyers during targeting operations is a practice it borrowed from the United States, says Craig. It begins a little bit in the Vietnam War in the late 60s and early 1970s. But it wasn't until the 1990s that the US military began employing military lawyers more frequently in battleground situations. The first major war that military lawyers are employed on the ground, giving advice in which targets can be struck was the first Gulf War in 1990 and 1991. Waves of Allied aircraft have been bombing targets in Iraq and Kuwait all day long in one of the most sustained aerial bombardments in history. In August 1990, former Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein invaded neighbouring Kuwait. Alarmed by these actions, the US and other Western nations intervened. This led to a 42-day US-led air offensive known as Operation Desert Storm, which killed between 3,000 and 5,000 Iraqi civilians. Craig says the Gulf War, as this conflict came to be known, revealed a major shortcoming in the international laws of armed conflict, that they leave too much room for interpretation by a country's own military and its lawyers. Military lawyers in that war decided on the, their interpretations of international law that targeting the infrastructure of Iraq, including its electricity and oil production facilities, because they were quote unquote dual use, which is they had a military purpose as well as a civilian purpose. So they went ahead and targeted the whole infrastructure of Iraq. And that had devastating consequences, not just immediately, but for years, uh, especially because of the sanctions, they weren't able to rebuild those infrastructures. And so what happened is hospitals didn't have electricity to function. Medications went off. Uh, waterborne diseases were rife. And that was in part because of a legal interpretation that if a target has a dual use, has a military use, we can target it. That theme has continued throughout the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001 and is implied increasingly also to Gaza. Often the real sort of work of military lawyers is done when general classifications of whole sections of the world are, are made into a sort of legitimate target. So it's kind of a preemptive loophole, is it? I don't think these lawyers approach it in terms of a sort of tax law loophole that says, hey, we're going to look at this law and say, oh, there's, there's a little gap there. Let's exploit that. I think ideologically, they believe that that is a right interpretation. Their argument is that literally, one should be able to target whole infrastructures. One should be able to target a entire tower block and raise it to the ground if the enemy is hiding uh, weapons in the bottom of it. Is that a loophole? Maybe some would say yes, but it's sort of much more than that as well. Some countries have very different interpretations of the laws of armed conflict than others. The argument, and I think it's a relatively uncontroversial one, is that the US and Israel take a, an aggressive approach to those interpretations, i.e. they believe that the law allows them to do all kinds of things, which, for example, many continental European states would say that they are not allowed to do under their interpretation. In effect, Craig says, this means that international law has been domesticated or tamed, he says, by certain countries to fit their own purposes. When one does that and when powerful states do that and they do it for long enough, without too much opposition, 
their argument is that that has a habit of creating law itself, i.e. making new law. And so you have these quotes, one of which in the book is that this was from a very senior military lawyer in Israel, that international law, quote, proceeds through violation, that what is prohibited today will be allowed tomorrow. When it comes to the decisions that military commanders are making back in the war room, this all feeds into the different ways that countries determine what constitutes a legitimate target. So those are rules of engagement. Those are rules on top of or in addition to the laws of war. One of these is called the NCV or Non-Combatant Cut-Off Value. They call it a magical number in the US military. What that number is, is the number of civilians they're allowed to kill in a particular targeting operation that they do not need clearance to go to a higher command level in order to take for that targeting operation to go ahead. For example, in 2003, in the opening salvos of the bombing of Baghdad, this magic number, as it's called, was set at 30, which is to say that if the commander wanted to destroy a building or take out a known target, they were able to kill up to 30 civilians without having to refer up to Donald Rumsfeld or George Bush, who were the the men in charge at the time. If it was 31 or 32, then they would have to refer up. Each US administration sets its own number for how many civilians can be killed in an individual strike without it needing approval from the very top. It waxes and wanes with the political considerations. Uh, It's been as high as 50. That was in Mosul in 2016 during the campaign. During the campaign against Islamic State or ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And that was for one specific target only. That was an ISIS bank that was deemed so important because this bank had so many US dollars in that it was being used to fund ISIS activities that the US military decided to set this number uh, at 50. So what happens when more people are killed when it's above that number? There's a, there's a number of scenarios in which things can go wrong. One is when all of the computations that go into this stuff were just wrong. You had you fed the wrong intelligence into it. You thought that there were five civilians in the building. Turns out that the next door building was a whole school and you've killed a bunch of school kids. And this sorts of thing you know, happens not infrequently. And in which case one throws one's hand up and appeals to something called the Rendelic rule in international law. It's not often talked about, but it's massively important. The Rendelic rule says that the commander is responsible only in as much as for the information that he or she had at the time that they made that call. So if they did not know or cannot be shown to know what was in the next door building, that there were other civilians that could be killed, then they are not legally responsible for that. Another type of scenario is when a strike doesn't go as intended. Maybe the missile doesn't land where it needs to. Uh, Maybe they anticipated the building wouldn't completely collapse, and it does. And that's sort of filed under the sort of accidental, which is slightly different from incidental effects. In a small number of instances, so-called accidents like these have led to an initial probe. There are all kinds of organisations around the world which work to document this stuff. If enough noise is made, then the militaries will open preliminary investigations which are not investigations per se, but sort of a brief inquiry into whether that is sort of broadly legitimate. Did the strike take place? What did their intelligence say? So often at that stage, a lot of investigations are closed before they've even got off the ground, really. If there is enough evidence to show wrongdoing, however, militaries can decide to take it further. This is what Israel did a lot of in the post-2014 war, so it investigated in 2015. All these allegations come forward by human rights organisations in Israel, And, you know, nine times out of ten, they say, actually, there's nothing to find here. If you go back to the same time when it happened in 2009, uh, they killed 1,400 people, including 700 civilians and 300 children in that war. The only crime that they found was that some soldiers looted a place uh, and stole a wallet and went to prison for three months. And then if some wrongdoing is actually found, they will launch a sort of full investigation. But these full military investigations only happen in extremely rare cases. Now, this happens at only very, 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 very high levels, both political levels and military levels, when sort of famous cases, when, for example, in in Yemen, a whole bus full of civilians uh, were killed a couple of years ago. A busload of children hit in this airstrike. The Western-backed, Saudi-led coalition responsible offering no apology 
This was a legitimate military operation, they said. Or when in 2016 the US military bombed and destroyed the Médecins Sans Frontières hospital. Doctors Without Borders continues to demand an independent war crimes probe of the US bombing of its hospital in Kunduz, Afghanistan. Or when German forces bombed a truck that they thought was a military truck, but it was actually just a uh, civilian fuel truck for petrol, and they killed about 30 civilians, uh, also in Afghanistan. And even these serious investigations don't lead to any real accountability or justice for the victims, says Craig. I can count them probably on two hands in the last decade or two. They produce reports which run into hundreds or thousands of pages, and they're serious investigations. But to my knowledge, I don't know of a single one that ever leads to an indictment which gets us anywhere close to public understandings of war crimes. What they find is either sort of a few rotten apples making some bad decisions on the way, or more often than not, systemic failures. The failure to know what was happening, the classic fog of war. And remember, this is the military trying itself. This is not a court that we are uh, familiar with. It's nothing like anything what we've seen on TV. It's nothing like the International Criminal Court. There is no judge as such. There is no jury for sure. They are, you know, cynically judge, jury and executioner in these cases. So essentially, what Craig is saying is that with enough pressure from the international community, militaries can be prompted to investigate themselves. Yeah, exactly. And he says that these investigations don't actually lead to justice for the victims of a strike either. Now, there are other ways to trigger investigations, more specifically with the help of the International Criminal Court, or ICC. And to help us understand more about the court's role in investigating and prosecuting countries for war crimes, we're joined by Justin Bergman, International Politics Editor for The Conversation in Melbourne, Australia. Hey, Justin. Hi, Justin. Hi, both. Justin, it's great to have you with us. And you've recently worked with an academic who wrote about the ICC for The Conversation. Can you tell us how that came about? Yeah, so if you remember in May of this year, Israel's Supreme Court was preparing to hand down a decision on whether a group of Palestinian families should be forcibly removed from their homes in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of East Jerusalem. It's been a long-running campaign, expelling Palestinians from East Jerusalem's old city while encouraging Jewish settlers to move in. The situation quickly escalated, leading to a full-blown conflict between Israeli security forces and Hamas militants in Gaza. 256 Palestinians and 13 Israelis were killed, and over 72,000 Palestinians were displaced. Since then, there have been growing calls for the International Criminal Court to investigate war crimes, And this is where Amy McGuire comes in. My name's Amy McGuire. I'm an associate professor at the University of Newcastle Law School in Australia. And my areas of expertise are in public international law and human rights law. Amy wrote a piece for me about what role the ICC has in bringing justice to victims of conflict in Israel-Palestine. But before she explained that, she gave me a bit of history about the ICC. Over the second half of the 20th century, there were various attempts to try international crimes in ad hoc ways. For example, the UN helped to establish international criminal tribunals for Rwanda and for the former Yugoslavia after conflicts there. Chamber finds Ratko Mladic, guilty as a member of various joint criminal enterprises of the following counts, genocide. These international criminal tribunals were the predecessors to the International Criminal Court. But by 1998, global demands for justice led to a more permanent mechanism being set up to try international crimes. The ICC really was a new start, and it was established by a treaty that's known as the Rome Statute because it was agreed in Rome in 1998. The treaty came into effect in 2002, and the court was established in The Hague in the Netherlands. As of today, 139 out of the 193 states have ratified the Rome Statute. This means collectively they've agreed to establish a permanent international court that would prosecute the most serious international crimes. So states who adopt the Rome Statute, who sign up to the International Criminal Court, they're obliged to incorporate its norms into their domestic law. But of course, many states, uh, most notably the United States, have refused to commit to the ICC. The Bush administration formally renounced support of the International Criminal Court yesterday in a letter to United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. The United States was actually very involved in the drafting of the Rome Statute, but later refused to become a state party and in fact has set up multiple bilateral treaties with other countries 
to avoid its nationals being arrested or brought before the ICC to be prosecuted. And Israel is also not a party to the Rome Statute and it specifically rejects the ICC's assertion of jurisdiction over its territory. But in special cases, the UN Security Council can actually refer a case to the court and in that case, the duty to cooperate with the ICC extends to all UN member states, even if they haven't signed up to the Rome Statute. In fact, there's this special principle built into the system called complementarity that obliges state parties to prosecute at the domestic level. So the ICC only steps into a situation where a state is unable or unwilling to prosecute an international crime. There are four categories the ICC uses to classify international war crimes. So these are the crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. And the ICC can take action against the nationals of a state party, or it can take action in relation to crimes that are committed in the jurisdiction of a state party. But once a case is referred to the ICC, Amy says, it can take years to prosecute. ICC has a really detailed and lengthy process for running a prosecution and eventually a trial against a criminal accused. So justice happens very slowly at the ICC. Amy says one of the things we should understand about the court is that it doesn't have its own police force to make arrests. It's reliant on the cooperation of state parties to help it undertake prosecutions. So it can say that a person should be brought before the court, but it can't physically apprehend them. It relies on one of its state parties to do that. And say a person has gotten to that point and been brought before the court. First of all, some of the judges of the court have to decide whether there's enough evidence for the case to go to trial. And if they do decide and a trial goes ahead, then the same criminal standard applies as we are all familiar with um, from domestic prosecutions. So the prosecution has to prove somebody's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And at the end point of the prosecution, the judges have the capacity to sentence a convicted person to up to 30 years imprisonment, and in exceptional circumstances, they can actually impose a life sentence. But countries don't always cooperate with the ICC. One example is when the ICC issued an arrest warrant for Sudan's former president, Omar al-Bashir, in 2009. Today, pre-trial chamber one of the International Criminal Court issued a warrant for the arrest of Omar Hassan Hamad al-Bashir, the president of Sudan. for war He was accused of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes committed in Sudan's Darfur region. When al-Bashir attended an African Union summit in Johannesburg in 2015, South Africa's court ignored the ICC's warrant, even though both countries were signatories to the Rome Statute at the time. Judges at the International Criminal Court are seeking an explanation from South Africa for the non-compliance of its ICC obligations. But Amy says even getting to the stage of prosecution is extremely rare. The ICC has a very small caseload. It has initiated only 30 cases over the past 20 years. Four of those have been resolved with the conviction of the suspects. One of the reasons for this is that countries have refused to cooperate, often alleging that the ICC's chief prosecutors are politically biased. As with many things in international law, we see a high degree of political influence over the way in which the court can carry out its functions. And it's also subject to a persistent argument, in fact, that it has an African bias in its prosecutions. South Africa plans to quit, accusing the court of bias against African countries. Which its prosecutors dispute, but which has also led to issues around countries refusing to support the court because some African countries have actually withdrawn their support on that basis. This is important because it's the chief prosecutor who decides whether to go ahead with an investigation or not. They determine whether there's sufficient evidence of grave crimes that fall within the ICC's jurisdiction, and also whether it's in the interest of justice and of the victims to establish a prosecution. If the prosecutor gets to that point, then they will go to some of the judges of the ICC and ask the judges to issue an arrest warrant that a state party can act on. In March 2021, just before her term as chief prosecutor came to an end, 
Fatou Ben Souda announced that the ICC would look into crimes committed by Israelis and Palestinians. The International Criminal Court has opened an investigation into suspected war crimes and crimes against humanity committed by Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory. We had this really quite controversial and dramatic statement um, from the ICC prosecutor when she confirmed that she was opening an investigation into crimes committed on Palestinian territory since June 2014. So her investigation can take into account the recent conflict, but it will look back as far as 2014. Although Israel is not a party to the Rome Statute and the ICC, the Palestinian Authority joined in 2015, which is why the court decided to open the investigation. But Israel said it had no legal basis to do so. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu accused the court of bias and anti-Semitism. The decision of the International Court to open an investigation against Israel today for war crimes is absurd. And the crimes that are being alleged span across two categories of international crimes. So there are war crimes and crimes against humanity being alleged here. And she launched that investigation after nearly five years of preliminary examination as to whether or not it was appropriate for her to investigate further. So I think what we can see there is that the ICC has taken a long time and determined that what has been happening in the Palestinian territories is at a very high level of gravity and severity. How feasible is it then that war crimes will be properly, uh, adequately investigated, and that anyone will be held accountable? Well, that's the million-dollar question for people who are really focused on the justice of the situation. Perhaps over time, the prosecutor might conclude that crimes have been committed by Israeli nationals uh, that ought to be prosecuted. And if the prosecutor reaches that view, she may seek arrest warrants from ICC judges and the judges could grant those warrants. But in practice, um, what this would likely mean is some limitation on the travel capacity of anyone subject to such a warrant. Whether any state would comply with that obligation is a different question. And I think, of course, this is unsatisfactory for victims It's also unsatisfactory for the ICC's cause of accountability and ending impunity for international crimes. But if an investigation were to reach the stage of accusations against individuals for crimes in Palestine, I think that that would still be a politically and legally significant outcome, even if prosecution was practically impossible. The reason I say that is that it could influence the behaviour of some other states in relation to Israel. I think that's sort of the most that you can hope for. So it sounds like it's all very much in the balance as to what's going to happen next. Yes, exactly. And actually, the ICC now has a new chief prosecutor, a British lawyer called Kareem Khan, who was sworn in in June. And he's inherited some very politically tricky cases, including the Israel-Palestine investigation. That's a difficult one to start off with. And, And I'm sure you'll be following that closely. So... Thanks very much for coming on, Justin, and talking to us about this. Thanks. It was my pleasure. We're going to put some of the links to the stories that Amy Maguire and Craig Jones have written for the conversation in the show notes. So do check those out. We're taking a quick time out here to tell you about another podcast from Pushkin that we think you'll like, Cautionary Tales. Host Tim Harford draws on history and social science to vividly retell the stories of great crimes, accidents and disasters of the past pointing out valuable lessons for us all from the dithering, death, and destruction. You'll ride with the Light Brigade as they charge headlong to certain death, watch the trial of the art forger who fooled the Nazis, and shudder at the deeds of a kindly doctor who was in fact killing his patients. You can binge the entire season of Cautionary Tales right now, wherever you get your podcasts. Now for our second story, we're delving into some new research about the way children understand language, specifically sarcasm. Sarcasm, I guess when you come to think of it, it's quite a tricky thing to understand. Totally. When you say something sarcastic, you mean the opposite, and that makes it hard for kids to understand. But one researcher has been looking into how kids learn sarcasm and what that process shows about language development. I'm Penny Pexman. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Calgary. And my research is all about how we understand language. 
But there are a couple of particular things that I'm interested in. And one of them is how children learn to understand language. And before we get into the specifics, I was hoping you could just run me through sarcasm. So for example, last summer, my sister gave me a haircut. We were in the middle of the pandemic. It was objectively a terrible haircut. And my friend walked out and said, oh, nice haircut, Daniel. He was being very sarcastic. But walk me through the psychology of what it takes to understand that my friend was rightfully making fun of me. Sarcasm is in some ways the most interesting because it really does involve saying the opposite of what you mean. And that is something that is uh, sort of flies in the face of of how we tend to conceptualize communication. You know, we tend to think, well, we talk to each other so we can understand each other and and you communicate so that people will understand what you mean. So to actually go to the trouble of saying the opposite of what you mean, given the risks involved in someone misunderstanding you and taking what you say the wrong way, there must be some pretty big payoffs in terms of why you would talk that way. On the surface, it seems like a positive comment about a haircut, for instance, but knowing what the haircut really looks like and knowing the attitude of the person delivering the comment and knowing something about your relationship might indicate to you that their attitude is actually kind of negative. And so you're left as the perceiver with this conflict between what is said and what is meant. In part, you know, the the gap between those two things is what makes it funny. But it also creates some of the challenges as the person hearing the comment wrestling with what do they really mean? Um, And in order to figure that out, you've got to exercise some pretty sophisticated cognitive skills. And you're specifically studying this in terms of children. So why did you decide to study children and sarcasm? Well, I think um, there's a few reasons. I'm fascinated by child development. And with sarcasm, you bring together a whole bunch of different aspects of child development because there's language skills. You've got to understand exactly what the words mean that the speaker has used. There's cognitive skills. You know, as I said, you kind of have to wrestle with the positive and the negative and figure out, read the mind of the speaker. But there's also a lot of social going on there and emotional understanding. And that emotional component um, is, is in most examples of sarcasm. And so empathy also seems to be an important ingredient. Um, another reason is because it tends to be one of the last things that kids figure out in language development, because there's so many other things they have to do first. And then individuals who have a diagnosis of autism, one of the common experiences they have is, is really having a hard time understanding what people mean when they're being sarcastic. And so it, it felt to me like a research problem where you could really get at a whole host of really fascinating aspects of child development. So certainly a lot of good reasons to study sarcasm and how it's learned. At what age do children start to begin to maybe understand sarcasm? Most typically developing kids who are good language users and are on track in terms of all their developmental milestones, they'll usually start to understand around age five or six. But what they understand is not like a full-blown comprehension of the sarcastic speaker's intentions. They tend to recognize at that point that the speaker doesn't actually mean what they said, but figuring out why the speaker is talking that way and why this person is using this opposite language, that's something that seems to take longer. Okay, so um, I can tell you're not being truthful. What happens next? What, and at what age does that generally tend to occur? So, so around five or six, they get that you don't mean what you say, not sure why. And then it takes usually at least a couple more years um, until they're six or seven or eight before they understand why you're talking that way, that you are actually criticizing the haircut. So recognizing that kind of critical intent seems to be the next piece. And that usually comes with starting to appreciate that the speaker is trying to be funny. But for a child, that's actually one of the last things they figure out about sarcasm is the humor. So, so it creates this situation where they might get that the speaker doesn't mean what they say, but they really aren't enjoying the joke for a while. Huh, that's really interesting that they might understand it all the pieces, but not get that you're supposed to laugh at the end. (laughs) Okay, so you did an experiment. What were you trying to figure out? What was the question? So we were really struck by that you could have, you know, a six or seven year old who's really got advanced language skills, and they seem to be very empathetic. And yet they just can't understand sarcastic speech. And so we're left in this position where there's there's clearly things that are related to, to understanding sarcasm, but there's some missing piece. There's something else they need to have 
one of the things we started to think about was experience and social experience, because we had found that there are families where there's a lot of sarcasm used and um, there are families where there's not very much. And it tends to be, there is this relationship where the children who come from those very sarcasm prone families tend to be good at comprehending the sarcasm when they come to our lab. So there's a suggestion that that maybe you just need to have lots of examples. You need to see how people respond to it. Maybe someone is even explained, hey, you, this is sarcasm. This is why people use it. So you've kind of got like a, a mental category for it. And so we decided to test that in the lab. And so we recruited some five and six-year-olds pre-COVID when they could still come to the lab um, and sit down with the experimenter one at a time. And what we need to do first is figure out, as they show up at the lab, how good are they already at sarcasm understanding? So we, we test them by showing them a series of puppet shows. This is something we've we found in my lab is, is engaging, and kids seem to understand that puppets can be sarcastic. And so some of the time in the puppet show, one of the puppets is sarcastic, and sometimes they're literal. And then we ask the children a series of questions designed to figure out what do they actually understand about what the speaker has said, and, and have they detected the sarcasm. And so of the 111 children that we recruited, some came into the lab already very adept and they, they aced our sarcasm uh, puppet shows. But most of the children didn't because they're five and six year olds. They're just at the cusp of starting to understand it. And so we knew we had some room to change their knowledge and see if we could train them to be slightly more accurate in detecting sarcasm. So following those initial puppet shows, we assigned the children to to two conditions. So half of the children were randomly assigned to um, a training condition where they learned in a fairly short interval, they learned about sarcasm and got to work with some examples. And then the other half of the children were assigned to a control condition. And the children in the training condition worked through a storybook that we had devised that involved a number of different scenarios with illustrations. And sometimes one of the characters used sarcasm and sometimes they didn't. And we gave the children also just some background information about sarcasm is saying one thing, but meaning the opposite. And we do it to, uh, to joke or tease or to criticize. Um, so kind of giving them some of that knowledge and seeing if that made a difference. So the control condition was just a, a storybook that had no sarcasm in it. So nobody learned anything about sarcasm in the control condition. And then afterwards, we retested them with some new examples of sarcasm, some new puppet shows. And what we found was the children who had had the sarcasm training were more accurate at picking up sarcasm after training. So it suggested that there was something that could be learned just from working through some examples, getting some a little bit of instruction about what sarcasm is, and that that could help the children to appreciate why people use sarcasm. And how much of an increase in uh, knowledge was there between the control and the experimental group? The experimental group was about 30% more accurate than the control. So it was a significant difference. We really wanted to see like could a single episode of training, could that actually change a child's understanding of, of what sarcasm is and why people use it? And it did. So I think the inference is if you actually talked about it on multiple occasions and provided a little bit more experience, the effects would be even more robust. <laughs> Can you tell me about um, what you guys did to try and give people the tools to teach sarcasm to children and anyone else who might need to learn it? So we kind of distilled our official storybook down into this coloring book and designed it as, as something that would be most relevant for children between about four and seven. You can download it for free from childresearchgroup.ca. And it's a short storybook. The idea is it would be read by a parent or a caregiver or, or a therapist. Children can color the pictures if they want. And it's a story about a little girl called Sydney figuring out sarcasm. The hope is that this will be kind of a fun way to spark conversations about what sarcasm is and why people use it. Awesome, Penny. Been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on to talk with us. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was Penny Pexman there at the University of Calgary. You can read a story she wrote about her research on theconversation.com. To end this episode, we've got some recommended reading from Megan Clement in Paris. Bonjour, this is Megan Clement, a commissioning editor for The Conversation in Paris. 
My first recommendation is for a story that appears in French on the conversation about how the oil giant Total, recently rebranded as Total Energy, is getting into the wind power game. Sylvain Roche from Sciences Po Bordeaux traces the long history of fossil fuel companies' flirtation with renewables, which goes back to the 1970s. Now, the super major is investing in floating wind turbines off the Mediterranean and northern coasts of France. But as it cultivates a greener image in Europe, where oil majors are having their feet held to the fire by activists and increasingly the courts, Total continues to invest in fossil fuels further from home. The company approved a $10 billion oil field in Uganda in 2020 and spent $16 billion on its largest ever offshore rig in Nigeria the year before, all the while continuing to prospect in the Arctic. My second recommendation takes us into the fascinating mind of the octopus. These precocious underwater creatures can change colour, construct their own armour and use tools to hide or catch prey. This formidable brain power also makes them difficult to study in the lab. Lisa Ponce performs intelligence tests with octopuses at the University of Caen in Normandy, where her subjects have been known to drown underwater cameras and stage escapes through the tiniest of cracks. You can read the article in either English or French on theconversation.com. Megan Clement there in Paris. That's it for this week. Thanks to all the academics who've spoken to us for this episode and to the conversation editors, Justin Bergman, Holly Squire and Susanna Schmidt and to Alice Mason for our social media promotion. You can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, Instagram at theconversation.com or email us podcast at theconversation.com. You can also sign up for our free daily email. Just click the link in the show notes. If you're enjoying The Conversation Weekly, please do leave a rating or review wherever podcast apps allow you to. And please tell your friends and family about the show, especially those who may have never listened to a podcast before, but you think might enjoy listening to the scholars we talk to each week. Show them how to find a podcast and how to find us there. The Conversation Weekly is co-produced by Mend Marawani and me, Gemma Ware, with sound design by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sol. I'm Dan Marino. Thanks, as always, for listening, everyone.